everybody. Welcome to the podcast. I have special guest Chris Lujan on the podcast with us right now. Former military, current government contractor. So welcome to the podcast, Chris. Thank you, Bobby. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And this is not the first podcast you've been on. (laughs) Unfortunately, (laughs) the last one had a little bit of a run-in where we had some technical difficulty caused the podcast to get deleted. So again, Chris, welcome back, man. Good to have you on with us. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. Congratulations. I know you started a new job about seven days ago. Um, t- talk about it. What is, your, what is your new job? What is the title and what goes on at that job? So the title of the job is Communications Field Engineer. Uh, and basically what I'll be doing is the same exact thing I was. Uh, I'll be in, responsible for putting projects together. Um, like right now I'm working on uh, renovating a operations room. And when I say renovating, I mean mm-hmm. consolidating all the different spots that we have our customers doing operations into one room, one massive room, and building it from the basically the floor up as far as how they are going to interact with our equipment. Mm-hmm. And what I'm doing, which is kind of cool, uh, first first uh, real application of us doing you know the thought process or the theory behind it is using a system that allows them to have only a desktop version of a computer to interact with all the different computers or systems that we use for them to do their job, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, a headache. It's a headache, (laughs) but you know, it's where we're, we're pushing forward. We're getting things done uh, with this new company that I I started working with. It basically is a contract that I was working on that was up contract went to bid the new company won. I got pulled over to the new company working on the same contract. Mm -hmm. And, but so right now, I'll be doing the same thing, but the transition is kind of slowing us down because the new company has to assimilate all the projects and then redistribute them to the you know prospective people who are going to be doing them. And you know, as of right now, I'm still the most southern East Coast field, or engineer period who's responsible for Key West, Pine Castle, Jacksonville, Mayport, and Buford. Oh, Key West down the very yep. south. Yep, Key West. Gotcha. And, uh, you know, I will say, thank God, Key West doesn't call for help and ask for engineering projects too often. (laughs) They have a great team down there. Yeah. They usually take care of it a lot of in-house, and, uh, you know, I appreciate them for it. Um, Actually, matter of fact, one of the guys down there, Techmer, I, you know, I call him a lot of times, you know, hey, I'm having this issue with some software. Can you help me? He's like, yeah, I got you. Uh, Again, I don't know why he's down there. He probably loves the life, but, uh, you know, very, very good team down there. Um... And it, you know, it's just really awesome. And like I said, you know, I'm fortunate that they don't call me because otherwise I'd be do a lot of travel and not be able to enjoy the house that I bought. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. Your your job title is you. So you're a government contractor, and your job title is communication field engineer. When you're talking about your day, what is what quantifies success in your day? How do you know you've had a successful day? I know I had a successful day when I walk away and I come home and I have a gigantic headache. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. It's a successful day on those days. Mm -hmm. Um, I know it's uh, it's counterintuitive. That's funny and true. But, um, yeah, it is true. Um, You know, success for the job is getting your job done of course that's you know basic layman's terms everybody can associate with that but really it's you know there's a lot more to it yeah i am a field engineer for communications but Mm -hmm. the small amount i spent on i spend on communications um i really get involved with procurement so buying things putting orders together I get involved with um, setting up meetings to discuss not with only you know my peers but also the people who are you know the big wigs as I call mm-hmm. them who can make decisions who can call me up and say hey you're not doing a great job just based on that meeting right <laughs> you know uh, you know so a lot of it goes into you know a lot of prep work so mm-hmm. well, first thing we do when we you know when we talk about success is we have a morning meeting with my manager and we tell the man our manager what we plan to get done. So if you look at it simply from a day, coming up with a schedule before the meeting, having avenues to complete that schedule before the meeting, and then after discussing what you want done, getting those tasks accomplished per day, 
is success. And of course, the success ranges as far as setting meetings, creating PowerPoints, creating a whole uh, meeting format, you know, discussion points and all that. Um, also procurement, calling different um, pr uh, providers, you know, why we got this instead of this when we ordered that. Mm. You, know, it, you know, there's a lot of things that come in, you're like, well, that's not what I ordered. Why did I not get that even though this? And then half the time, honestly, it's because we set up the quotes, the, the, uh, we get the bids, we put them in, and then the actual procurement team decides that, well, this basically does the same thing that you want, and it's cheaper. So we're going to buy this instead. So there is another part of the, the day that I have to deal with. And A little have, negotiations exactly, going back Exactly. I have to call my procurement team and tell them why I specifically asked for the expensive one. Yeah. Even though that the one you ordered was basically the same, but it's not going to do what I need. Mm -hmm. And then I have to go through that. And then, you know, then after that, it's shipping labels. It's doing all, all you know, so, you know, we only have maybe about three or four things to do in a day that yeah. we report fully knowing that it's going to easily count up to 20, 25 plus things that we have to do because now we run into all these situations where we need to get this done. Are those checks and balances of the procurement department trying to find less expensive but similar items, are those barriers, are those headaches, or do you think those are sometimes necessary? I do believe they're necessary. Um, for any, I would say, lesser team, um, now I'm the junior on the team, Yeah. but I, from my experience, any lesser team would need those checks and balances but we as mm -hmm. the team that i work with anyways we when we get our quotes when we get our uh, bids in we have already cycled through all the things and picked the cheapest that we can find for what we need because the goal is to be able to do what we need mm -hmm. that's our goal but the secondary goal is to do it as cheaply as possible yeah. government contracting everybody wants to be cheap we understand that we already do that we put forth the effort to already find that so when we right go to that's battle, a good point of view right there yeah yeah so when we go to battle you know quotation yeah. air quotations right when we go to battle with mm -hmm. procurement we we already have settled that we are the cheapest that what we want is the cheapest mm -hmm. so we can go you know head right into the flames mm -hmm. and argue with anybody because we know we're right that we, you know, we ordered the cheapest possible. You've what done we your need. due diligence. That's that. Yeah, you go due diligence. We've already done that. Mm -hmm. But if we didn't do that, then yes, checks and balances from dealing with procurement would be a necessary evil. So it's, there's there's a lot of points where it's like we don't even need this department. We don't really need their opinions. We're so experienced. We know exactly what we need to do to get the job done right there. And these big wicks. Uh, when you're working for a government contractor, when you're involved with government contracts, these big wigs, have they started from the ground level and kind of came up through your shoes and they kind of understand your needs? Or sometimes are they brought in from other companies where they might not necessarily understand what your guys' needs are? Um, I would say, so when I say big wigs, I'm incorporating government and contract. And I'm also incorporating and talking about your managers. Okay. Those yeah. folks as well, too. So the contract side, those big wigs, yes, they started from the bottom. Mm -hmm. They start, well, maybe not the bottom, bottom, but they started close enough to the bottom yeah. to understand what is needed, mm -hmm. how we work, you know, fully confident in our work ethic and the information we provide. Right. They have started from near the bottom. The yep. government people, I, you know, those, those big wigs, I don't know. I couldn't tell you where they came from, what they wanted, because my interaction with them is through my manager. <laughs> because, right. Because, mm -hmm. you know, for us to, you know, to, to save our butts, we go through our manager. So that way, even if we do talk directly to anybody in the government, the manager's either CC'd on that email mm -hmm. or he is a co-party on a phone conference because they need to know what's discussed. And right. that's, that's the biggest thing. So I couldn't tell you if the government has been anywhere. I can tell you that they started somewhere yeah. and it wasn't in that position. So they, they know something, but you know, as far as I'm concerned, you feel like you're, they don't know. You feel like your managers have your best interests in mind though. Definitely. No, my, my managers, the people that I've worked with in the seven days it's I an spent important at feeling the new company. Have. Oh yes. At the new company, uh, dealing with all the in doc briefs and you know, all their, our virtual meetings, mm -hmm. I can tell that they, they want to have our back and the only way that we sacrifice that opportunity is if we don't perform our job mm -hmm. which is to do like what i discussed earlier now you're somebody like 
may you spend a lot of time preparing and planning for the day so you go into battle ready and prepared. Oh yeah, schedules is a major aspect. <laughs> yeah, talk to me about some of that. Like, I know when I'm working, on my days off, I like to have a good one or two hours a day where I'm planning for the upcoming week, whether it be by getting projects completed, going through emails, talking to teammates, upline counterparts, making sure that everything's in sync so that when I actually start the operation, when I go in, I'm very well aware of all the different moving parts that are gonna be in play, all the personnel, all the technology changes, all of that stuff I'm well right, aware right. of due to the planning I've done beforehand. So talk about some of your planning beforehand when you're working with government contracts. Uh, my planning is mostly scheduling. I have to schedule, when I create a schedule for myself, obviously mm -hmm. first number one, you have to have a schedule for yourself throughout the day. If you don't have a schedule, you'll easily get lost in other, pro in other things to do for the job besides focus on what you need done that day. So creating a schedule for yourself is a major standpoint. And of course my schedule ranges for, you know, is for you know, 10 to 15 hour day. Mm -hmm. But after creating a schedule for myself, I also have to communicate with all the O&M and those are the, the O&M is referring to all the people at the local ranges. Like for Buford, for instance, I have the, 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 the operations room that I'm consolidating is in Buford. I have to communicate with Buford to figure out their mission schedules. Mm. I have to communicate with Buford to figure out their permitted and maintenance schedules. To, to, I have to create schedules of when and when not to be able to get a hold of people when I need information, how I need the information, what paperwork I need, what document I need, when to expect it. Because let's be honest, if you're expecting a document in the morning and you don't get it until the afternoon, that kind of sets you back. Yeah. But mm -hmm. one thing you have to do is create those schedules. And when I create those schedules, I actually create them for the whole week. Mm -hmm. So my main focus for the day is create my schedule. Then Monday morning comes, I create the schedule for the week for everybody else. And like I said, that incorporates more than just what I need for my project because my project is a full encompassing thing. It is a thing that by itself will take people's days and just eat them. Yeah. So what I have to do is create a project, uh, not a project, but a schedule for the whole week to make sure that my project isn't eating up into the O&M's job. Yeah. Because their job is not solely to help me. But being as I'm satellite and I can't do the things physically, I need someone there to do it. So, you know, I have to incorporate their their schedules, the mission schedules for the operations, which is not only just local. I mean, they're, they're dealing with the military. So they have squadrons who need to be able to fly. They have, you know, missions that they need to be able to take care of and to have coverage for. They have to deliver those missions for debriefs. I mean, there's a lot more going on that I need to be able to incorporate into scheduling my week. Right. Which, like I said, a good day creates a headache. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is very true. And the more you continue to climb from an entry-level position to a mid-level to a higher position, the, the more complexity that is in there and that the better planning that you have going on beforehand allows the battle to go on a whole lot better. What, what type of things do you do to stay ahead? Career and life, what, what do you do? Honestly, learn. Yeah. Uh, that's really the only thing you can do to keep, keep ahead of something. Mm -hmm. One, okay, if you know something is coming up down the docket, preemptively learn how that thing is going to impact not only your work schedule, your day, your life, but how to assimilate the people who are associated with that particular thing. Because as a... Uh, I like that, assimilating people in. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because, you know, uh, when it comes down to it, as a, uh, as what I do anyways, communicate communications field engineer. I'm more of a jack of all trades than a specific SME, subject matter expert. So mm. yes, I do know I do know a lot about communications. I've dealt with it for the last 10, 15 years. But when it comes to everything else, especially the new equipment, the new day and age, the new technology, other people have other strengths as far as software, how this thing has worked. And if you can get a hold of somebody who was ground up, built that software to assimilate into the current 
configuration, mm -hmm. those are the people that you need to bring in, at least be friendly with, mm -hmm. so that way if there's an issue, you can call. Mm -hmm. So again, it comes down to learning. You need to learn the system, yes, basically what I do is I learn the gist of it. What does it do? What is it supposed to, what is it, what is its job? Why is it trying to be brought on into our configuration and how do we expect to use it? Mm -hmm. My next train of thought is to learn how to basically get it to work. So if you have issues programming something, basically learn how to fix those issues. Mm -hmm. So not only just the programming it, but if you have an issue programming it, how to get the, past those issues. The next thing is to learn who do I need to contact. Everything is all about learning. You learn, there is no, there is no stopping to learning. I mean, when I'm done with my day, I do work. I come home, I still write my reports, but I also start to look at, I make notes throughout the day, look up CMMI model, which is a, a, a meeting whatever thing. I haven't looked it up yet. You know it? But I it sucks, made a note to look it but up. You're 100% right. You have to continue learning nonstop. Oh, definitely, and definitely. I smile only because I'm like, no matter what we do in life, we have to continue to constantly learn. I mean, I have books laid out over there. At work, I have to continue to learn new things. Like, it'd be nice to just get your education. Don't and be now done you, with it, right? Yeah. <laughs> just be done with it and good to go. But it's not the case. Hey, man, on those situations, you know what I take uh, to take to heart? Is that when you're done with your education and when you're learning something, you don't have to write a paper anymore. <laughs> right. I take that, yeah. that silver lining right there. That silver lining. I don't have to report to anybody. I did have to spend the time to learn it. But I don't have to report to anybody saying that I learned it. <laughs> yeah. I, I like that we talked about planning on this. Long-term planning promotes short-term decision-making. Yes, definitely. Because the more you know, the quicker you can make a decision. Yes, absolutely. And, and if you, you know the more before you meet, have to make that decision, makes that decision even quicker. And you don't look bad. Like if you make bad decisions, you can look very bad sometimes. If you make good decisions, you can look very good. So you go and you properly plan. You properly prepare, and all of a sudden you're making good decisions and you're doing the right thing, and eventually it leads to more job promotions and more headaches and more stuff of that I'm nature. Telling, right telling. there. You know, uh, when I was when I was a, a young and well, not so young, young, but you know, when I was younger, I used to look at the people in charge and like, oh, they got it easy. Mm. You know, they get to sit in there, you know, air yep. conditioned office, whatever. Mm -hmm. But the more the the, the higher I cr climb, the more I learned that no, in fact, it's very true. They need to know. Mm -hmm. theoretically more than what we do when we're installers because they need to fight those battles for you. Right. And the only way they can do that is by knowing the knowledge. And the only way they can know the knowledge is if you're doing your job. Mm -hmm. Installing, this is the issues we run into, this is how we can do better. Reporting it, this is the whole, this, this is the important thing about reports that some people need to remember. Like I still need to learn sometimes. Write a report of lessons learned, what happened, yeah. what went wrong, what went right. Because what your leaders do they take those lessons learned and they fight for you. The, the military is very big on that right there. Yes, it is. Before and after, always going through lessons learned. What could we have done differently? What should we do next time? The big question is to be asked. Right, because I mean, their focus is to not only do it better, but do it faster. Yeah. And the mm -hmm. only way they can figure that out is the people the boots on the ground as we call it in the military boots on the ground mm -hmm. making the reports yeah without those reports the leaders cannot make the decisions of how things can go better and how things can be faster and also giving you know, giving them a better idea of who they need so this is you know pulling away from the military but when it comes to civilian side if someone's not performing the way they need to they can either move them somewhere else where they're going to be better or provide more mm -hmm. or kindly ask them to walk away right because they need a team that can function in a better and faster environment as a leader you have to understand what's going on with the boots on the ground definitely you have to know it from their perspective you have to be able to see it from their shoes otherwise you just don't have that understanding no no and without that understanding you can't make good decisions right and, you know, you know, actually, I want to take this back to when you said make bad decisions. I've been on this team for a little over a year, actually almost two years now, and I've made bad decisions. The best thing you can do about bad decisions, own them, mm. learn from them, and then you'll understand 
how to better assimilate any kind of information that you have to make a better decision. Yeah, at Amazon, if you make the wrong decision, but you can speak to it, you can provide data to it. You Saves can... your job too, if you can own that too. Yeah, true, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, you can just say, hey, look, I understand I was wrong in this situation. I messed this decision up right here. These were the circumstances involved. This was the data involved so that I can quantify what was going on. This is what we're gonna be doing next time. These are the pieces already in place so that as this situation arises again, we're better equipped to deal with it moving forward. The, the senior team, the general manager team, they look at that and say, okay, yeah, you have a lot of knowledge. Yeah, that was good data. Yeah, definitely make sure that works next time. We're oh, good yeah. with that going forward. Yeah, definitely, yeah. because it, it gives them the opportunity to not have to investigate. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, more, and more than they have to yeah. as far as, you know, because, you know, there's going to be an investigation at some point. The, the like, they don't to have to be. go too yeah. deep. They don't have to waste their time doing that. And mm -hmm. they know that they don't have to spend the time telling you. They know it's under control. You because you have already provided them with what you can do better next time mm -hmm. and then you owned up to it it's not like oh you point the finger at somebody else and then now they have to look at that person that person gives them just an account of their day and how it wasn't their fault now they right. have to go back and forth trying to figure out whose fault it was it comes back to you now not only did you not own up to it but you're a liar right and lying is the biggest factor for people to want to not have you work with them you can't trust someone that's lying. Exactly. You can't, you can't rely on them to do their job mm -hmm. and to be upfront about it. There's a lot of people that are, they're not, they're almost like, I guess the word would be like, unfortunately, they kind of become almost pathological liars. Oh, yes. yes. Like they start believing some stuff in oh, their yeah. head that might not be true. And I think everybody can kind of fall victim to that one time. Easily, easily. Yeah. So you have to kind of be very self-critical of yourself to make sure that you're not believing certain things that might not necessarily be true so that you keep going in a good direction. Yeah, you know, when it comes down, you know, you know, I made a comment of coming home from work and continue working at home. Yeah. One of the biggest things that keep me up at night is not a project going bad, not a project that is not coming together the way it needs to. That's not the forefront of my mind when I can't sleep at night. The mm -hmm. forefront of my mind is if I did and made a decision that was not quite right and I don't, explain myself to somebody why i made yeah. that decision why mm -hmm. i made at that point in time this decision when 10 minutes after i made the decision more information came up to me and i'm like well i wish i didn't say anything. you know say yeah that. you know like, <laughs> yeah um so, and that's the forefront so a lot of what i do at home when i come home is not only am i doing my reports i'm sending emails to my boss I'm like hey look this happened this happened this happened this is my decision on it and this is the fallout from it right once I can do all that, I can crawl into my bed and I can sleep because my mistakes aren't being hidden, aren't being camouflaged. I'm not going to have a dream about, you know, being caught red handed somewhere. Yeah. No, I've come clean and I will, you know, fully prepared the next morning yeah. to wake up to a, an email that says, call me, which is never good. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or an email that explains to me that, you know, thank you for being up front. Mm -hmm. This is what, this is the plan moving forward, and now I have the help from my manager of how we can remedy the bad decision that I made. Mm -hmm. So you know, and, and that's another, another tool of the trade for success. Yeah, never be afraid to ask for help. Ab absolutely, never be afraid. Everybody who's anywhere, you know, you know uh, Bill Gates, uh, the guy who ran at Apple, who who's that guy? Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Yeah, they didn't do it on their own. Oh, good. They, may be, they may be the yeah. smartest people that they, you know, yeah. it, at the time when they were doing the company of creating Microsoft, creating Apple. They had big visions. But those big visions require help. A lot of people. To supplement them. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people who are afraid to ask for help. Don't afraid, be afraid. Even if you're, you know, you know, you know, in a job, you're a cashier at a gas station. If you don't know how to ring the cashier up to be able to give the guy return, you know, on a couple of chains because you, you forgot to give him that $10 change. Ask somebody how to do it. I usually like when people ask for help. Yes, and yes. if any one of my managers asks for help, I really enjoy supporting them. If any one of my managers, assistant managers, ask me for help, I really enjoy supporting them. The only time I don't like help is if somebody doesn't necessarily go through the chain of command. Now, if they're having a serious health situation or 
they're requiring some right. kind of first right. aid. I get it. You're coming to me directly for help. Let me help you right now. But I love yeah, when you people... You don't want to be that jackass. Hey, you're bleeding from the arm. Yeah. I ain't going to help you. You didn't go through it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I only get frustrated sometimes with people when they try to skip the entire chain of command and come towards me. Because there's certain things that if you're asking me a question, I have no idea if your manager or assistant manager has plans in place. And if you're trying to, help to you, right? yeah, so I really like when people try to follow that chain of command as best as they can. And yeah. I understand sometimes you have to go around it. I right. get that. But generally speaking, trying to follow the chain of command, it does have a lot of benefits. Yes. And, you know, one of the benefits is having that problem nipped in the butt before it gets anywhere where you have yeah. to worry about your job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. you got nipped in the butt at the lowest level possible that it can. Yeah. And it's. You ask for help, hey, all right, you know what, better next time, or yeah. whatever, you know, whatever it is, you know, because mm -hmm. you have, you have that backbone of the chain of command, which you can look at the back, you know, the chain of command like a spine. Mm -hmm. Without that lower part, you ain't walking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, If you only have the upper part, yeah, you can move your arms, but trying to function your legs ain't going to work. Right. So, you know, in dire situations, sure, jump to the top. You know, harassment, yeah. any of that crap. Serious. Go ahead, jump to the top. First know, aid yeah. situation. Yeah, yeah. That definitely go. But, you know, when it comes to family problems or you made a mistake, ask for help somewhere. Or if you, you worried about making a mistake, ask for help. It's better to ask before you make the mistake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you have to build up that level of support. And if somebody comes down, you know, somebody at the top learns about your mistake and then asks you about it, you can honestly tell them, look, I talked to so-and-so. And you know what that does? That takes all the weight off your shoulders, put onto the person who helped you, mm -hmm. which is going to be the next change of command. Which, let's be honest, the higher you go up the rung, the more support you have as far as being able to make a mistake and not be removed from your position. Mm -hmm. And if you know the guy at the top comes down to the lowest guy, that lowest guy reports him to the middle guy. The middle guy says, "Yes, we had this issue. This is the, the workup on it. This is what happened." This is how things kind of devolved. This is the fallout from it. This is how we bettered afterwards. Mm -hmm. And this is why we're producing better numbers. Mm -hmm. This is why we're you know performing better. Mm -hmm. The guy at the top is going to be like, bottom dollar, we're performing better. Yeah. Oh, whatever. You know, mm -hmm. move on. Next issue. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that quick. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. A lot of managers do just want to know. What's the situation? What's the outcome? What's the next issue? Exactly. Next issue. That's, What's that's, going on with yep. this? All right, everybody go back into the field. Let's continue on. Um, Chris, as a um, government contractor, um, you know, you're also somebody that has purchased a home um, here in Jacksonville. A very nice home. So first, obviously, congratulations on the home Thanks, there. Sir. I think that's something that's important with real estate. And we spend a lot of time on this channel talking about real estate is, you know, it was just what, one year ago, you were renting apartments. Yep, yep, just about. Now over here, you got new home over here, big home, Jacksonville, Florida. Um, you got you got some good stuff going on over there, man. You're renovating it a little yeah. bit. What, what do you have going on in the house now? Uh, one of the projects I have going on is uh, changing my office from carpet to, uh, what was it, uh, TLP? Or no, no. Uh, LVP, there you go, LVP, laminal, no, no. <laughs> I don't know what it is, the, 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 the expensive vinyl planking, there you go, laminate vinyl planking. So redoing, redoing yeah, a bedroom I'm upstairs. Redoing, I'm redoing one of the bedrooms, yeah. which is my office, and honestly, it's just a pet peeve of mine of mm -hmm. my chair when I need to roll from monitor to monitor to computer to computer, I do operate on multiple computers, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it's Same kind here. of a kind of a pain mm -hmm. when um, the carpet doesn't want to let you move yeah. because you know you sit on it, you create those indentions, you know, indentions in the carpet with the wheels, and then you try to to roll. You know, I tried to remedy Good vocab word indentions. You know, yeah, I like that. I, I tried to I, thank you. I've tried to uh, you know, remedy it with the 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 plastic um, you know mats that you put on carpet to to roll the chair. But those they yeah. don't know. You know, unless yeah. you're willing to spend 175 bucks to get a nice real rigid plastic. Yeah. You're not rolling very well, but then even if you spend the 175 on that plastic piece, uh, it moves. Mm -hmm. You know, so so as you move, it slides, it slips, it moves around. Um, you could do that mo numerous times, or like in my decision, you could replace the carpet with tile, get better, you know, casters for the chair, and roll about your day without even worrying about anything. Yep. <laughs> you know what I like about your 
financial decision to go purchase a home is you're proactive in taking rental contracts and rental options yes. to your spot. Yeah, you gotta keep the options open. Yeah, you've had a couple people offer you um, to rent your house for much more than your mortgage cost. Yeah, so almost, you, almost double. Than yeah. My mortgage. So like you're you're sitting there, you're renting your home, you're there, you're living, you're sitting there, you have a mortgage, you're enjoying your house, and you're open eared. You're letting your realtor send you constant offers for rentals. And while you've declined all that, it must be nice just to know that hey, I have these options on the table. Oh yes. I mean, when is it not nice uh, when you find out that something you own is coveted? Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's nice, whether it be a car, whether it be a gold chain, or in my instance, a house. Yeah. To know that that is coveted, mm -hmm. if you're having a bad day, you're having a bad day, you feel low to low. Yeah. But you gaze upon what you know is coveted, mm -hmm. it brings a whole new perspective to your does bad does bring day. a new perspective. It's it, a very you, good viewpoint. Yes. You know, you, you have to, like, you know, a lot of it is looking at the silver linings of everything yeah you have bad instances bad uh scenarios bad life look at the silver lining mm -hmm. i've had a lot of support and a lot of it came without me even asking for it which again makes me even more appreciative of it because it was only until recently that i learned ask if you need help ask mm -hmm. not 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 just for the job Mm -hmm. Obviously, for the job, most mm -hmm. people are comfortable asking questions. Life advice. But life, there are situations that, yes, nobody has lived your life, but they have had their fair share of hardships. Similar experiences. True. And, you know, you just ask. Whether it's just a conversation, you ask for information. Honestly, that's mostly what I do. But you can also ask for a little bit of help somewhere else. I mean, there's no nothing against asking. Yeah. It's what you do with that help if you get it. And in your shoes, just telling your realtors, hey, I want offers on this property. And some people in some instances almost giving you double of an offer compared to what your mortgage is, that is a very good feeling right there to have. This property here that we're in, I, I'm taking offers on it. Oh, and definitely. While I've accepted none of them, I just like to know, like, where is the market at right now? Oh, you're willing to right. pay me that much more than my mortgage costs. Nice. You're learning. Yeah, absolutely. Learning. learning. That, that's the key to learn. It, it is. And you know what? A year and a half ago when I was living in apartments, I wasn't, I didn't know about all this. Right, right. You know, you don't even think about it. Yeah. You're now in an apartment. I, I mean, yeah. what do you care? <laughs> yeah. You're too busy wrapped up in giving your money to someone else. I mean, what, what are you worried about? Real now, estate. Now I know. Now I understand. Like, wow, okay, this is my mortgage. This is the rental price that I would get right now. Anytime I want to tap out and leave, well, I could resell it and make this amount of money on it. Or I can put it as a rental and have this guy over here run the rental property for me. There's a lot of options that are on the table. Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, like, even for me, if I can get double my mortgage for a rent, I mean, yeah, sure, you think, you know, think I would take it, you know, right off the bat, but, mm. you know, risk reward. Yeah. If it's double now, when my property value goes up, what is it gonna be then? And then you gotta factor in, if you're too busy, yeah, you have to have somebody manage it, and have them manage it, you have to pay. So if, you, if I do now, if I do a double, um, you would like to think that my 30-year mortgage would go to 15 years mm -hmm. paid off because I'm getting double. Mm -hmm. Well, in reality, no, because I have to pay someone to manage that property. I have to pay someone to make sure my property is still taken care of by the people renting it. Mm -hmm. So you have to factor in all that. So it's a risk-reward. Again, just even simply going from apartment to home, it's a risk-reward. Yes, the risk, you spend a lot of money to buy your house. Yeah. The reward is what we're dealing with now. Yeah. You know, being open to offers of rental, that's our reward. We're learning. We're still learning by uh, osmosis, really. Yeah, day you know, by day. We're, you know, they're, they're, you know, the realtor is kicking us the offers, mm -hmm. and we're just absorbing it, and we're denying it right now. But there may be a time when we accept one. Right. But right now, by osmosis, by just getting the update, saying somebody's willing to rent the house for this much money, we're learning that our property value is good, mm -hmm. first off, uh, that it's going up, second off, and thirdly, the most importantly, 
is that we have options. And right. the biggest thing to have is options in life. That having options is very important because you're able to understand what is what is available to you. What could I be doing versus what are the other options that I could be doing rather than thinking there's just one path that I'm going down right. and I have no choice but to go down this path right now. Yeah, the uh, the uh, equivalent to that is a horse with blinders. <laughs> the reason why we put <laughs> blinders on horses is mm -hmm. so they only think there's only one path. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why we do that. They're only focused on what's in front of them instead of what's on the side. Right. Because, you know, back in the day, horse drawn carriages, you didn't want that horse scared shitless when mm -hmm. it came to wolves stalking your carriage. Yeah. You know the wolves aren't a problem. The horse doesn't know that. Its natural instinct is to run away. Right. So you put the blinders on them. <laughs> hey, focus on the road, man. Yeah. <laughs> Go straight down and, that you know, way. With that, though, you're, you're, you're blinded to what your options are. Mm -hmm. So in retrospect, you have to think about it that way. Just yeah. you know, dumb it down to something simple. Chris, if, I want to... I want to thank you for coming on this podcast. Oh, we, no, it's been a pleasure. We are, we're pleasure. going on the 36, 37 minute mark right now. And I usually try to keep them a little bit shorter, but this was a genuinely value added conversation that I had a so. lot of very good insights. And one of the reasons I was happy to bring you on is a lot of times people don't understand what government contractors are. Like, I know I didn't really. Like when you told me when we met a year ago, you're like, I'm a government contractor. I'm like, oh, that's interesting, but I don't know much about it. <laughs> yeah, you, you, ex do? you explained to me a whole lot about what yeah. goes on there. And a lot of people are former military. They have engineering degrees. So when they hear some stuff like this, it really opens their mind to, wow, I could possibly do some of that work right there. And oh, yeah, definitely. It definitely. was very good to have you on, Chris. Enjoy the rest of the day, and you are welcome back on very oh, soon. Thank you, Bobby. I appreciate you having me, man. And I... Uh... Fully plan on being back here. This is this is good. This is a good opportunity.